This is the Zealous Podcast with Rocky Snyder, the show that's all about the pros behind the pros. This week, I have the honor of sitting down with Dr. Greg Rose, who's the founder of the Titleist Performance Institute just outside of San Diego, and he is going to just explain a whole bunch about golf, golfers, and what it takes to make them pros. So I've, I've had another podcast that's been running, I, we're in the fourth season now, but I have a whole bunch of people lined up for it. Uh, I took some coursework in biomechanics and gait uh, analysis after going to TPI and Gray Institute, and it kind of just led me down this rabbit hole. So for the last six years or so, I've been studying gait and basically what every articulation does through the three planes of motion. And we use that as a, a filtering mechanism to look at how people move and also design like strength conditioning programs on it. So a lot of my colleagues worldwide, they stretch from Europe to Australia and everywhere in between. I decided that that podcast, I would just kind of devote time to exploring how it is they're using that information of anatomy and motion. And uh, while doing that, that stretched out into next year. So I thought, you know, I'd love to do a different podcast that partly perform better presenters, but also like the, the professionals behind pro sports, because you hear about all the coaching and the athletes, but you don't really get to learn much from the people that are like the athletic trainers, the yep. sports specific coaches and so on. So that's, that's kind of where this all came about. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. Very so cool. I, I love organic conversations, but if you have things that you would like to bring up, things that TPI or elsewhere are doing that you want to bring to the light. But I'd love to talk about basically coming from uh, Palmer. You were in Davenport, Iowa, right? Isn't that where you went? Correct. That's okay, correct. So you went to Palmer, got on the golf course there in between going to classes. And then what brought you out to Oceanside and TPI? Like maybe a, a just a brief kind of origin story with that. And sure. then what you guys are doing at Titleist and maybe some of the, the PGA and LPGA members that are your training and not that we have to name all the names or anything, but, and then, and then uh, golf TV or anything like that, just kind of give an understanding of what we're looking at when training the rotary athlete, specifically the golfer. But, you know, if we want to carry over into other sports, that's fine too. Yeah. Good. Okay. okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you my, my quick background. So, uh, Undergraduate was in engineering, University of Maryland, decided to go into chiropractic, uh, went to Palmer College of Chiropractic, like you said, in Davenport, Iowa. Um, I, I always uh, loved golf when I got to college. I learned how to play golf. So when I graduated chiropractic school, I was one of those nuts that said, hey, I'm going to try and open a practice just for golf. Everybody told me I was crazy. I opened up a practice called Advantage Golf in the Washington, D.C. area, and it exploded. Um, that, that practice started in 1996. It's also the year Tiger Woods started, so that I think timing has a lot to do with this. Um, but within five years, I had over 3,000 patients from all over the world that were golfers. In the year 2002, I met the CEO of Titleist. Um, I worked on his son, Peter Uline, who was nine years old at the time, who's now on the, the uh, PGA Tour. Um, so obviously, he was a pretty good young kid. And uh, a, a golf pro by the name of Dave Phillips in Baltimore, myself and the CEO of Titleist kind of put our heads together and, and decided to open up a training center for Titleist. Just kind of like, you know, the every NFL team, every MLB team has a training staff. No golf company ever had a training staff. So the CEO was like, hey, we should take care of our players just like other sports do. And like you and Dave to do that for us. So we set up something called the Titleist Performance Institute in San Diego. I would, uh, we kind of opened the doors in 2000, end of 2003, and I've been in San Diego ever since. Um, I think, uh, I, so, you know, the golf, we'll, we'll get into it, I'm sure, but the golf world has gone crazy from er, er, everything, studying uh, the, the biomechanics, like you said, you do a lot with running and gait. So looking at the biomechanics of the swing, looking at the physical aspects uh, for training, looking at nutrition from club fitting, anything to help uh, performance. We've actually developed into one of the top sports science centers in the world. We get a lot of cool toys to do R&D, and that's led us into other sports, like you said. Uh, in 2014, uh, the CEO of the United States Professional Tennis Association, the USPTA, approached us about doing some education for them. And I started a company called Racket Fit, which is basically you can get certified for tennis. 
and you mentioned Dr. Tom House, who's coming on your podcast in 2016. Um, Tom's on our advisory board, opened up a company called On Base University, where we do education for baseball and softball players. Uh, we have over 2,000 people certified through On Base. Over 600 of them work in MLB teams. TPI, we do certifications for golf. We have over 24,000 certified TPI professionals in 64 countries. We teach that in 10 languages and in on 22 countries. Um, RagaFit's got just over a thousand people, it's probably the smallest of them. And then last but not least, just to kind of finish my bio, 2008, um, or I should say 2004, myself, a guy by the name of Greg Cook, uh, physical therapist, a guy by the name of Lee Burton, Mike Voigt, we actually got, came together and developed something called the SFMA, the Selective Functional Movement Assessment. And in 2008, SFMA and FMS, the Functional Movement Screen, merged and I became one of the owners of FMS. So I've been a, one of the owners of FMS since 2008. 2009, we got a station at the NFL Combine. So we do a station at the NFL Combine. 2011, we got the NF, uh, NHL Combine. So we do uh, screening at the NHL Combine. We pretty much have FMS, functional movement screen trainers in almost every sport, every league, every federation all over the world. So other than that, I got nothing going on. Yeah, you're seeming like you've, you've got all the time in the world to just kick <laughs> back. You're in retirement. Yeah, not, not a chance. So it, it's, I've been down to the Titleist Performance Institute through one of the, the certification levels. I think it was level two that I came down there several yep. years back. And I was just blown away. You know, you, you're kind of in the middle of an industrial area, but mm -hmm. you've got an entire golf course in your backyard. 33 acres. It's amazing, our facility. That is incredible. And yeah, it's really cool. It's, uh, it's in Oceanside, California. So like between San Diego and LA, a little closer to San Diego, but we have three fairways. We have short game complexes. We can actually have a par four, par five, par three, and you can actually play nine holes on it. Um, but we have, like I said, our biomechanics labs, putting centers, all the club fitting. It's, it's pretty cool. And how many, how many uh, sports scientists are in Titleist Performance Institute right there in Oceanside? Well, it depends, when you say sports scientists, it depends on like we have, uh, there's, I think there's four or five club engineers that just try and design the latest golf clubs and looking at motion capture. We have R&D professionals that kind of take equipment for Titleist and test it on consumers. We have the ball engineers out there that, what, what does that mean? They have robots that they hit golf balls every day. And that data goes back to Fairhaven, Massachusetts, where Titleist designs the latest Pro V1s and golf balls. Um, of course, myself and Dave and, and some of the people in the, in the physical conditioning, we have an entire gym where we do a lot of the testing on our players, getting the physical data. We have an entire biomechanics lab, two biomechanics labs, where our club R&D for, um, for Titleist, where they help design clubs. And we look at players to look at performance, trying to optimize their swing. So there's, there's all kinds of stuff going on. There's, there's about 28, 27, 28, let's say employees that are walking around there all the time. And now you don't have just the PGA and LPGA uh, tour at golfers coming into your facility. It's, it's open to the public. So if you're of the mind where you want to come down and go through the whole package where you want to get uh, club fitting, you want to get your, your golf stroke and now analyzed, 3D, you want to get coaching. I mean, you run it from soup to nuts, right? Yeah, there's there's two ways to come see us. Number one is if you are a Titleist sponsored player. So obviously when you sign a contract with Titleist, we're part of your team. You can come use us anytime you want. Now, obviously there's there's a calendar and it's, it's hard to get a spot here, but if, if there's a will, there's a way we can get you in here. The other way is we do what's called a factory fitting where Titleist will actually fit you for your golf clubs, just like you were, you know, one like, you know, one of our uh, players, uh, you know, like an Adam Scott going through a fitting. So they'll, they'll, our fitters will walk you through an entire fitting, kind of tell you what clubs they think that you should do. Scotty Cameron has his putting studio here where you can go through and look at your putting. And then we do these, what are called half day experiences where you can go with Lance Gill, who's kind of my right arm for 20 plus years, takes you through the motion capture, the physical screen, they kind of lay out an entire conditioning training program for you, kind of tell you, you know, hey, what, what they see from a biomechanics standpoint of, uh, for your swing and try and match it to your bodies for conditioning. So you can do any of that stuff um, through, through titles. That's awesome. Now, hey, 
I've just got to ask you one thing that's been kind of burning in my side since I went through TPI uh, so many years back now. I can't even recall. It's, it's probably been about uh, about 10 years since I went through the certification program, came back. I went to one of the golf courses here in Santa Cruz and and got a group of golfers and put them through kind of like a 12 week yep. conditioning program, which was fantastic. And then I was expecting and it's my own downfall, I'm sure. But I was expecting to get more and more golfers to come into my studio. But the interesting thing I learned Greg, was that they don't tell other golfers <laughs> like if you, that, you know what, you know what that means? golf it, game, it means one of two things. Yeah, it's either number one, they're just not good at referring or which usually the more likelihood is you're the secret weapon and they don't want people to know what you're doing because they want to take money off their partners when they play. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, <laughs> I'm the secret weapon and there's aren't too many places, aren't too many guys around here or women that are willing to, to share that knowledge. However, when it comes to tennis or less common handball, you get a whole bunch of people coming in here because, well, you need that other person to play with. So you better keep them healthy be so that the, the person that initially came and saw you can keep on playing. But well, I, I, this is, this is going to sound sexist, but I, I, I think men are worse at that than, than women. I think women tend to do social and tend to share with their friends. Guys, you know, they keep a secret weapon. But the more you do, you'll realize it's a small world and people are going to hear about you. And next thing you know, uh, everybody's going to be seeing you. <laughs> that's, that's what I find. Now, you, the, the rotary athlete, obviously, you know, I was talking to Bill Parisi a couple episodes ago, and he started out as a javelin thrower, but he realized that in order for him to create a lot more power, he needed uh, more speed. So then that carried a javelin thrower into understanding speed development. But you with golfing, being a rotary athlete, you obviously realize that it's carried over into just about every other sport that has a club, a bat, or a ball. So, do you, and you're in the NFL Combine. Where where do you find like TPI or your own personal career path? Where do you see it going with all this? Are are you expanding into new horizons with different yep. sports that you weren't considering? Yeah. So so to me, like our philosophy is pretty simple. If you if you have an athlete and they're injured right? We do what's called the SFMA, like I mentioned earlier, the Selective Functional Movement Assessment. That kind of tells me why you're injured, what's, what's the cause, what's the source, figure out the impairments. That's, we do that on every athlete exactly the same. Now, if you don't have pain, you just want to play better, or you want better performance, we start with two things. We do the functional movement screen, just gives me the idea of your basic movement. We always say it's kind of like vital signs. You know, if you go to the doctor, they're going to check your pulse and your respiration, your heart rate, well, movement, we think is a vital sign. So we would look at your basic movement and then it's, all right, what are you trying to do? If you're like, I'm trying to be a quarterback in the NFL or I'm trying to be a PGA tour player or I'm trying to be uh, on the WTA or I'm trying to play you know, professional softball. Once I know what the sport is, we actually do sport specific screening. You know, like, like in golf, we would need to know kind of how your wrist can work and you know, can you disassociate things that are unique to the sport. And what we do is we kind of develop those sports specific screens so we developed one for tennis for the serve and for ground strokes and we have for baseball pitching and for fast pitch softball and for hitting and we have you know uh, for golf for tpi and that's kind of what we do and we've actually started to develop that for a couple other sports we uh, we started developing one for lacrosse uh, we were doing some stuff with the u.s lacrosse we still might be doing some stuff with them uh, i have a project down in mexico with the mexican football federation for soccer um, so we've kind of been dabbling in the soccer world, but I can see over the next, you know, three to five years, us going into multiple sports, trying to add that little sports specific piece, just to make sure we don't miss anything that's unique to each sport. So is it that you take some of the elements from the SFMA, pull them? No, they're like, different. Or no, is it is the, strictly the sport, sport. Yeah, good question. The, the sports specific screen is, is not looking for health of movement. It's looking to predict what you might do in your sport from a biomechanics standpoint. So in other words, movement screening doesn't tell me what you can and can't do. It just helps me understand why you do it that way, right? So in other words, if I want to know like why you serve with your foot like that or why when you get into the cage or when you pitch, why do you, why do you fly open a little bit earlier? Or why, why does your glove spin a little? Like all those things could be due to just, you just didn't know it's a technique problem or it could be because you're taking the path of le- the path of least resistance because your body doesn't move any other way. So what we do is we create these movement screens to try and 
like honestly, one of the cool weapons that we give you, you know, is a TPI is we can take somebody in a room, we can physically screen them and we can predict what their golf swing looks like. We can also predict now what their tennis serve looks like. We can predict what their pitching looks like. We can predict what their hitting looks like. All those things are important in our sports specific classes. We teach you number one, how to do the physical screen. And then number two is how to predict what their technique will look like. Well, that makes sense. Okay. So, uh, I'm thinking of, of the movie Dodgeball and Obscure Sport, sport. sport quarter, <laughs> Quarterly, OSQ, right? So out of the OSQ, Obscure Sports Quarterly, uh, is there a sport right now that you're just going, uh, you mentioned lacrosse, but that's not really obscure. It's just not as popular nationwide, though it's becoming. But I'm telling you, we've been called by, if you're asking like what obscure sports have called. Curling. Like I got, I got called in to, in Beijing to the, Chinese Table Tennis Federation looking at table tennis. And I'm like, listen, guys, I don't know anything about ping pong. They're like, we call it table tennis. I'm like, see? So it, it's one of those things where they, and they actually were using our golf screen for almost, you know, 10 years. So uh, it, I, nothing's, I mean, we've been from horseback riding to canoeing to, I mean, most Olympic sports uh, from MMA, we've had conversations with a lot of them. Wow, that's wild. All right, so basically the, the gamut of, of summer Olympic games, basically. Uh, we, I just wait till you get the biathlons with the rifles coming in, I guess. That's, that's going to be yeah. the interesting one. Yeah. So it's, I don't think many people know that you connected with Gray and Lee uh, and, and you helped write the book, The Movement. Uh, the title of the book is Movement. But I, you've been kind of, uh, no offense, you seem to be the quiet guy in the room when it comes to Gray and Lee. Of course, you're all three over at the Perform Better Training Summits uh, for year after year. But you're- I'm kind of the, I've been known as the sports specific guy. And then they do just general, you know, uh, for everybody type of stuff. So um, I got my little niche and that's in the sports specific part. No, nah, no, nah, it's more than a little niche. I mean, one of the other things that you were bringing in were the concept of training windows, long-term athletic development, uh, the youth golf program, as well as youth sports, and how do we condition and train in a progressive manner the youth of America to, to be you know, global champions, whether it's in the Olympics or in, in golf yeah. per se. How yeah. has that changed from the inception of that when you started first looking at like train, the concept of training windows? Do you still hold on to those or has that changed some? You know, I always say, listen, uh, anybody can work with a professional athlete. Professional athletes make bad coaches look good. They're just that good. So I'm like, anybody can work with a professional athlete. You know what? You want to know what's harder is make a professional athlete. You know, take a five-year-old, take this unmolded piece of clay and turn it into a professional. And that's one of the things that I, I think I'm the most proud of is that I think that's one thing most people don't realize is how many professionals we've created so, and helped develop. And so that's really become a passion of mine of, of, of youth development and uh, when I was hired at Titleist, uh, I was hired to take care of their players, but we were also hired to grow the game. So not only do we work on development, but we work on sport participation, trying to increase sport participation, which is a whole other challenge, right? Um, well, especially well, considering the historic way that kids were introduced to golf. I mean, you might as well just stand there and watch the grass grow. It was so boring. It was just uh, hit the I mean, ball, hit the ball, hit the ball. But you guys have a completely different approach, which well, is really all about fun. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we kind of know what, why kids play certain sports, right? So one of the things you're going to do is, you know, it's like, imagine like, if you're going to go uh, learn math, you're like, that's like, that's in a monumental task, but schools have figured it out. In first grade, you do this. In second grade, you do this. In third grade, and if you do it in this order, it tends to be the easiest and things tend to make, they build on each other to make sense. Whereas if you go to most sports schools, not even just golf, you go to, but if you go to a golf school, a lot of times it's the rookie coach has no curriculum and they go, ah, let's work on uh, chipping today for, I mean, why are they, it's like going to math in elementary school and they go, ah, let's work on calculus today. And the kids don't even know how to add, you know what I mean? So it really made no sense. So we just, I, I hate to say this, but we kind of just put common sense back into training, right? So number one, they're kids, it's gotta be fun. So we use a, 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 a principle called long-term athletic development, which is we got, we got plenty of time to develop this. Let's get them addicted to the sport, turn them into athletes first, and then teach the sports specific stuff because that's what the best in the world did whether they were trained that way or they got lucky we're just copying what makes them lucky and a lot of times like you said uh 
it's amazing on the human body and how we develop certain things happen at certain times in your life that allow us to develop certain things better than any other time in your life. Those are those training windows that you mentioned. It's kind of like, you know, there's certain times in your life where you hit your growth spurts, right? Like in puberty, you hit a growth spurt. Or right? never in my case, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in, in puberty, some people actually hit their growth spurt. And when they do that, you know, your bones grow faster than your muscles. Most people don't know that. So when your bones grow faster than your muscles, you can lose flexibility like immediately, like overnight. Now that can be a huge detriment for injury, but it can also be a recipe for performance because if your muscles get a little taut, your muscles are like rubber bands. They can create a little elastic energy. We can actually develop speed a little better at that time. So there's these certain opportunities that pop up along the way and uh, that we definitely still utilize. We've actually found up to 13 windows that we believe in from strength to speed, to endurance, to skill, to stamina, all, all these things that we feel that um, if you attack them at certain points in your life, you tend to get the most out of that athlete. Now, I always, I always say it's never too old. You can always teach an old dog new tricks. They're just a lot slower than the young kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, you use something that at least when I was studying was uh, the growth velocity curve. Mm -hmm. which is basically you're taking kids doctors reports that they go in and get the growth chart or maybe the parents are just taking they measure their the height chart yeah. for yeah to see how how tall they're growing and and usually using that as one of your indicators still is that something you're still using right well, what you're referring to is something called developmental age versus biological age you know like uh, i'm sorry versus chronological age like chronological age is based on a calendar right so Tell me your birth date. I can tell you chronologically how old you are. But as you know, anybody with multiple kids, you know, if you have two eight-year-olds, none, of, neither of them are, are eight at the same time. One's more like a 10-year-old, one's more like a six-year-old, right? Because kids develop at different rates, regardless of the chronological age. We call that biological age or developmental age. Now, the crazy thing is, is those windows we talked about, those opportunities of when you can attack flexibility and when you can attack strength, those are based on developmental age, not chronological age. So if you say, hey, we should work on all kids at age 12 for speed because that's when they hit their growth spurt. Well, you and I both know not all kids hit their growth spurt at age 12. Kids develop at different rates. So how do I know when you're hitting your growth spurt? Or how do I know when testosterone is kicking in? Or how do I know when you know, I can work on your cardiovascular system? That's based on, like I said, developmental age. And the best way to calculate that is using growth velocity by just looking at how fast you're growing. And that's something that doctors keep charts of for years, when you go to a pediatrician, you take your height, and we can see exactly based on how fast you're growing, where you are in a, let's comparing everybody apples to apples on a developmental age. And based on that is how we set up your training programs. And of course, you're going to have, for the most part, and not to sound sexist, but typically young girls are going to develop at a much different rate in two general. Years. Two Boys years. Do. Yeah. Two years. So yeah. now, how do you work that? Just, I'm, I'm really curious, like, in a group setting with young aspiring golfers and you're doing these different components of, of conditioning and athleticism, you're gonna have girls that are, are a couple of years yeah. older than, or a couple of years younger than boys that are a couple of years older. Yeah. So it, it is a big challenge. And one of the things it's, if you have tons of kids, then it's easy. Cause then I can create multiple groups, right? So like if I have 200 kids in my junior program, well, then probably at age seven or eight, I'm going to separate the boys from the girls because the girls are already too advanced, right? They're, they're, they've moved on, right? And we want to separate them. If you don't, if you only have 20 kids in your junior program, it's kind of hard to separate everybody because you want to do this group training. Then we say, listen, by, by, by puberty at the growth, like let's say by developmental age, 11, 12, you got to separate the boys and girls for more than just developmental reasons. Like they, they, it's just not cool for them to do it together. So um, underneath that, you can train boys and girls together. If you have tons of kids to get like a huge junior program, we would separate somewhere between seven and eight years old boys and girls, just because like I said, the boys need a little more time to develop and mature the athletic skills where the girls are already moving into skill. The boys aren't ready for that yet based on our, our experience. So, uh, we separate them if we can, um, worst case scenario, everybody's together till 11, 12 years old. And then we separate. Yeah, and now some of the listening audience is still thinking about uh, just getting the kids out there on the green and uh, working on their short game or their drive or their putting, but we, you're not talking that at all. I mean, there's going well, to be do that, that too. stuff, sure, yeah. but but the other elements that they may not be considering, give a couple examples of yeah. what you would well, do. For, 
Yeah, in the long-term athletic development world, there's this philosophy that we abide to called athletes first. And it's one of those things that if you, if you go back and do retrospective studies of the best athletes of all time, from the Michael Jordans to the, you just name it, to the Tom Brady's, usually what you're going to see is that they were a well-rounded multi-sport athlete that then specialized in their sport like around age 14. And those years of developing those athletic skills is what we believe helped make them so great in their specific sport because it created all these power and speed and agility and fear, no fear and courage, all these types of things that, that, that these athletes learn. And nowadays, as you know, parents think, well, if I want to be on the PGA Tour, I got to just do golf starting at age four, right? Well, that's not what the best players in the world did. Unfortunately, now they could play golf when they're young, but they did multiple sports all the way through. And we, we try so hard to, to explain this to parents that when you just do one sport and don't develop the athlete first, when they turn 15 years old, where it now starts to matter, when college scouts are looking at them, when they go to play in a tournament and they meet a kid that's just as good at golf, but they're an athlete, they have no chance of winning. They're going to hit a hundred yards past them. And they just, the kids quit because they feel like they can't compete. And guess what? They're right. They can't because they didn't develop the athletic skills. And now, you know, these, like we talk about these windows, I just don't think you can go back in time. You got one chance to do this right. We tell parents. And if you, if you miss the athletic development, I mean, it's, it's just, I don't think you can recover. Like you're going to meet, you're going to meet one of my athletes and they're going to just, they're going to drum you and the kid's just going to, he's going to quit. Well, talk about some of your athletes. Hey, you've been doing this uh, now for 12 years, 2008. Is that when you started Titleist? I, I love you, man. I, I wish it was 12. You know, I had my 50th birthday two days ago. So I've been doing this for, believe it or not. Oh, geez, let's see, where am I at right now? So I started in 1996. So what is that? 24, uh, 24, 24 years. I, 24, you know, 12 years. I like yours. 12 years is better. No, I hear you. I've worked it. <laughs> We're still the young bucks. I don't care what you say. Yeah, I opened up this studio in, in 96 as well. And I can't believe that. Yeah, I've got trainers who are younger than the doors of this facility. It's just I, I started. But the answer was I started working with Tyson in 2002. So 18 2002. years. Yeah. OK, so in that time, some of the young golfers that were coming in, the aspiring young athletes that you trained up, you mentioned that they've gone through the ranks and now they're they're turned into pros. Can you name a few of them? Are, are there any that are stand out for you? Uh, man, there's so many. Like I just, I mentioned Peter Uline, who's on the PGA Tour, that the CEO yep. son. Peter used to always come in uh, TPI, even like when he was like 13, he would bring his his best buddy Ricky Fowler, who I'm sure a lot of people know Ricky. Nice. Um, so Ricky's been one of the ones that was in there when he was really young. Uh, John Rahm is the number two player in the world right now. Um, you know, we have a relationship with the Spanish Golf Federation. When their players come over for college, we kind of take care of a lot of their players. So we started working with John. When he came over to go to college at Arizona State, I kind of helped John all the way through college. And then when he went out on tour, Dave, Dave took over as his coach and Dave's still coaching him. So we've been working with John since he was 15. Um, but we've, I mean, you name, I mean, name a player from the Jordan Spies wow. to the, you know, I, Justin Thomas, just all of them, all of them have been to TPI at some point in their, in their career. Some obviously spend more time with us than others. Like, you know, and then there's guys that you wouldn't even think, like three-time major champion, Patrick Harrington. You know, I've worked with Patrick for almost 17 years, right? So he plays the, the Tyler's ball, but he's all, all Wilson. But if you play the ball, you're able to come in. And, and uh, from the LPGA, like uh, I can, In Kyung Kim from Korea. I mean, players that you just wouldn't think of who just won the British Open two years ago. Uh, a very close relationship with. So it's, it's, it's. The gamut from Champions Tour to the LPGA to PGA to European to Australian Tour to the youth athletes. I mean, we a young kid that comes to mind that just started his professional career in China, the PGA Tour of China, Tian Ling Guan. Everybody calls him Langley. He's a kid I started working with when he was 11 years old. We were doing scouting in China. We found this kid, came out, he started spending summers with me. And at age 14, he made it. He won the, the, the Asian Amateur got invited to play Augusta National in the Masters, and at age 14 made the cut at the Masters, the youngest to ever make the cut at the Masters. I mean, there's so many stories like that that I, I love when we get into our junior program and just talking about and sharing that it, it's just, we met so many amazing athletes. That's incredible. And then you from the, like, the other sports too, by the way, we've had everything from Drew Brees throwing footballs out of our bay to Pete Sampras hitting serves to, you know, I've got the best, I'm probably five of the top 10 hitters in Major League Baseball were at our facility last year. We have some of the, I have two of the pitchers in the World Series were at our, our facility this year. I mean, it, it just goes on and on. That's, that's phenomenal. You know, you, you mentioned Korea and 
there was a time not too long ago where it seemed like the professional golfers, like the top seemed to be coming out of Korea. It's just like there was such an inflow of, of Korean golfers that it just- women. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and what do you attribute that to? Is it because they started with long-term athletic development so many years ago and then we're just seeing the maturity of that or what? There, there's there's a couple of reasons. Some of them not good, but there's a couple of reasons. So number one, there's probably more women playing golf per capita in Korea than any place in the world. So most people don't realize that there's a ton of women playing golf in Korea. Uh, number two is like you said, from long-term athletic development in Asia, you know, one of the traits of Asia that has, it's a double-edged sword. There's good and bad is they will outwork anybody. So work ethic is incredible. I mean, they will go out on the range and work eight, nine, 10 hours a day. I'm not saying to do that. I'm not saying that's good, but they will, they're told to do that. And if you're not working hard enough, then you're being lazy. And from our research, if you do that a lot, usually boys can't handle that. They, they rebel, they do stuff. Girls are a little easier to, uh, to go along with the flow there. So we do see more girls maintaining and not dropping out in Korea. And then one of the other big problems in Korea, that depends on what you call a problem, at 18, all boys have to go into the military. So now all of a sudden, no matter how good you are, unless you win the gold at the Asian Games or the Olympic Games, you get, you know, uh, you get, uh, you called uh, an exemption. exemption from the military. But other than that, you're going in the military. Like we had a great kid, Sung Yel No, one of the top players that, you know, on PGA Tour, and by, I think it was by his 21st birthday, he had to go and he just, he disappeared for two years. And, you know, it's hard to recover to come back after that, right? So we have the military with, with some of the, the men that creates a problem. And then culturally, this is gonna sound horrible, but when they're young, a lot of people are like, for the boys, no, you're going to school, you're doing stuff and girls, it's okay, you can go play golf. So uh -huh. there's a little culture issue there where sometimes it's not as easy for the men to, to play golf, but for all those reasons, and like I said, they have, they have, they have great access to driving ranges, tons of coaches, a great, the PGA there is very structured. Um, and uh, you said, put that work ethic on there and you're gonna turn out some great players. And what's the next burgeoning country when it comes to just got, professional I mean, we've had some big flux from Thailand coming out lately. Uh, India has got some, obviously they're coming, but Thailand, and especially on the LPGA is, is turning out some great players. Um, I would say, um, you know, South America is starting to bud some players from the Colombia had some early success doing stuff. Now we have from, from everything from Venezuela, to Chile to Argentina, we've got having players come out. Mexico is starting to develop some pretty good players, even in baseball there, Mexico is doing some incredible stuff. Um, obviously you got your usual subsex, you know, England and Scotland, and all the, all, all the, um, Australia and Germany's got incredible development uh, programs, Spain, has always had one of the best developmental programs. Um, that, that's pretty much the golf world there. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, I yeah. mean, Japan, Korea, and China are, China, I should say, China, and not that they're new, but man, you're gonna see, there's, they got some great players coming. I mean, we've been training players in China for a long time. They got some great players coming. Now, there's obviously so many other companies within the golf world, golf industry, but- None that matter, come on. Yeah, exactly, you know, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at. <laughs> are there any others that are, are growing an institute, nothing, not necessarily like TPI, but- well, yeah. are, Some of them have tried, right? So like, a lot of them say, we don't need to, Tylos is doing the research for us, and this is true, we'll work on any player. You know, I, I, we just had Ches Ch Ch Revy out there last week, and it's not Tylos. So um, I think, Taylor made has what's called the kingdom. They have their place in San Diego where they do a lot of the club and fitting, but they don't have the physical conditioning stuff like we do. Um, Nike tried to build one called the oven when they were in golf with Gary Gray, but they, they kind of went away from golf. Um, and Callaway doesn't, they have a testing facility, but mainly for clubs. We're really the only equipment company that really has all of the pieces. And now you mentioned you've got tens of thousands of certified professionals and there's different, uh, different categories that you have. Like there is the golf fitness professional. What other categories does TPI educate professionals? We really have three buckets. We have medical professionals. That's your chiropractors, physical therapists, osteopaths, MDs, you know, ATCs. That's the medical side. We have our 
fitness. That's your strength conditioning coaches, fitness experts, yoga, Pilates, all the, anything doing personal training. And then we have our coaches right now in the coaches, you have your, your skills coaches. We have sports psychologists. We have equipment fitters. We have some different categories in there, but really coaching fitness and medical are our three main categories that come get certified. And the, the cool thing too, is if there are aspiring golfers out there, or, or if you're a golfer and you're lousy and you want to do something different than what you continually go out there and do, then you can go to the TPI's website and there is basically find a professional near you right. and, and you can actually find a team really near you. So you can go and search yeah. out a medical professional, whether it's an osteopath, a chiropractor or whatnot. And then you can also get yourself a fitness instructor. And then you get yourself actually a swing coach, all right. that have gone through Titleist's kind of program, correct? Right. So if you go to mytpi.com, right, if you're looking for golf, this is, we have a find an expert tab. You put in your zip code or your city and you can search by medical fitness or golf coach. They all have one thing in common. They speak the language of TPI. They do the, the screen that helps kind of connect everything together. And this is also the same for onbaseu.com for baseball and softball. We have one, like I said, racketfit.com for tennis. We have the find an expert. You can find somebody who's certified to kind of get you started on your path. Now, this is the world of apps. There's an app for everything. So what kind of apps do you have that will help the average golfer out? So most of the apps that we develop are for our certified professionals, right? So we have FMS, we have our functional movement screen, SFMA, TPI, we have our TPI one, on base we have one, uh, racket fit one's actually coming. Now with that said, um, there are, we have a, an FMS, we have a move print app coming out, which is more of uh, like, uh, think of it more of, um, for co corporations like corporate wellness type of stuff to kind of figure out, you know, Hey, do I need medical help or do I just need some conditioning or am I good to go? And um, kind of gives you a red light, yellow light or green light based on your movement and give you some exercises. Um, but, uh, and we have a client app that we're launching for TPI, but all of it is linked to one of our TPI certified professionals. So our apps right now are really for our professionals. All right. But then you have the goal. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll say one thing is we yeah. do have an app in Mexico, right? So this is, a, this is for soccer. That's trying to help grow youth soccer. It's really cool. It's called football, a Metro, like soccer meter, football, a Metro. And uh, kids can go in and get evaluated by coaches or they can test themselves. They get put on a level from like one to 10, kind of like martial art belts. And based on your level, you're prescribed exercises and drills and you earn coins. And we have a store that you can get everything from physical tools to, Cool. You have an avatar and you can dress out your avatar. It's really cool. That app is probably going to be coming here in other sports too. So that is, that might be our venture into the consumer market. Very cool. All right. Then you, you've got the golf fitness world summit that, that had been happening, obviously. It was supposed to be this year, but right. just like everything else, 2020, we're hoping it'll be 2021. All right. And, and in that just briefly, you it's, it's not just for the golf fitness professional, but it's for, for golfers, and, and anyone in the golf industry that to right. learn so, more. So if you're, if you're a golfer and you're like, Hey, I'm just a golfer. I'm not a coach. I just want to get better. Okay. Our resources are number one, our website, mytpi.com. We got tons of articles and, and studies and things on uh, an exercise library with thousands of exercises and drills. All that's on mytpi.com. Same thing with on base rack fit. You can go learn about some of those for baseball and tennis. Uh, our World Golf Fitness Summit, like you mentioned, we usually do it every two years. That's a place where the, it's kind of like perform better. It's where the, the best of the best come to talk about everything performance for golf. And, you know, I say golf, but we have baseball coaches there because it's rotary athletes, but we have some of the best minds from the medical, the fitness and the coaching presenting on their ideas and stuff. That's every two years. It was supposed to be this October. We're hoping it'll be 2021 October. That's World Golf Fitness Summit. Um, oh. And and then obviously, if you go on YouTube, you know, you can see lots of our, our channels, lots of our videos. And, you know, we had a TV show for, for 10 years on the Golf Channel. We can still see those shows where we, just for consumers, just to kind of give you ideas and things you can do to improve. Are any chance of seeing you on Golf TV again, the Golf Channel? You know, maybe we, every once in a while we do a little cameos there. But uh, I think what we're doing, and I'm, I'm hoping if it wasn't for COVID, I think we we're going to do this. We're going to launch a show online. We actually get such a bit bigger viewership online than we do on TV because that's kind of where everybody is now is on demand. And, and uh, so I, 
look for that by the end of next year for us starting to do shows right out of TPI um, to kind of pick up where the Golf Channel left off. Fantastic. Now, in in my facility, when it comes to you know, assessing clients uh, and athletes of all walks of life here, I use a force plate, similar in a way that uh, Titleist might have it down there in, in your institute, where you're looking at force transference between the, the legs or between the feet at different points of the golf swing, I will have people step across it, walk across or stand on it so I can understand how they manage their mass and so on. It gives us a whole bunch of information. And then I'll use uh, my little app on my phone for video analysis and, and frame by frame looking at movements. Are, are there technologies out there that you are affiliated with where if say somebody's a trainer and listening to this and they are interested in uh, cool devices to help assess and so on do you have any affiliations with with companies like that or do you sell the tech yourself we we, we have sponsors for all of our seminars and we work with almost every technology in the industry out there but from specifically what you're talking about like our favorite app for video analysis is something called v1 um, they own something also called Right View Pro, but if you go like V as in Victor, one, uh, you can see them. It's a great tool that almost all the golf world uses to videotape and draw lines. Um, from a pressure plate, we use something called Body Track. Body Track um, is uh, a, a simple portable. Um, it does pressure in vertical force. It's not a force plate, it's a pressure plate, but it does give you vertical force. Uh, that, that's what a lot of the players use to stand on and swing and be able to tra trace their center pressure. Um, from a force plates, we have two AMTI force platforms out there, but there's there's multiple companies. There's a company called Gasp out of England that, that, that does a lot of the, the prep force plate stuff. Uh, there's one called Smart to Move out of Belgium that do some great stuff. Um, there's one called Swing Catalyst that does some stuff for force. From 3D Motion, obviously, we've helped write some of the software for 3D Motion companies. We have a company called KVest where they put the sensors on you and you can swing and hit and kind of, so KVest is a, is a great partner of ours. Um, so all the different, like we're always looking at technologies and trying to see, you know, how can we make the diagnostics a lot easier? And what is it that you're missing? How about that? You know, is there something out there you're going, yeah. man? Actually, what, what actually we've been talking about the, the main thing that I think is missing, but I think is coming uh, is like you said, hey, you look at the foot and, and the interaction of the foot to the ground is so important to everything you do. Well, the interaction of your hands to the implement to us is equally important. And there's been very limited technology for grip pressure, kind of like you look at foot pressure. Now we've taken some, some foot insoles and wrapped them around the grips to try and get grip pressure up. But now I think they're starting to develop some grips where we can actually get pressure. If we can get to the point where we can get force out of the grip of a baseball bat or a hockey stick or a golf club, I think that's gonna be a game changer for us um, to be able to learn from. So I think that's the technology that's coming. And then of course, markerless 3D motion capture. That's what everybody's working on right now. Take your video camera and using the video camera, try and get reliable quality 3D data. That's been the problem. We can get 3D data, but it just hasn't been that good. Um, but I see some big advancements happening that if you get, like you said, Dr. Tom House is coming on one of yours, ask him about his app, Mustard. Mustard. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's kind of where the world's going from diagnostics. Well, it's interesting too, because it really, Honestly, Greg, it just boils down to numbers, right? If you, if you have the, the correct understanding of how much force needs to pr be produced, vertical force off a force plate or grip strength, I, you're going to be able to pretty much tell what is needed for that athlete or, or at least how far are they going to drive that ball, right? Yeah. I mean, I, here's my thing on force is I always say, listen, uh, force isn't what you're doing. It's how you're doing it. Right. So if I want to know what you're doing, I'll look at a video camera, right? Or I'll look at 3D motion capture. That tells me what you're doing. But if I want to know how you're doing it, there's where force comes in, right? So, you know, what is I can visually see, oh, they're moving to the right, but how are they moving to the right? Are they pushing from their left foot? Or are they just falling onto the right foot to understand what it feels like in their body? Force is probably a better way to do that than video or kinematics. Yeah, because the numbers won't lie. Right. There's there's a whole bunch of ways to get around our defaults and, and our problems, but it's going to affect the numbers regardless. Yeah, like there's 10 ways to move to the right. Force will tell me how you move to the right. Yeah, that's it.
Wow, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate giving me the time to just sit and talk, even though I can tell you, I am a glorified hack. You don't want me out on the, on the course whatsoever. Uh, no, that's it. You just long ago, you said you, you grabbed a club and you said, if you don't, if you don't golf, never touch that in front of your clients. That's poison. Here's and I lived about. by those words for many years. Think about golf. Playing golf is a different story. It doesn't matter how you play. It's how you look if you, when you play. So if you're wearing one of these, we uh, you. you're good to go. Get uh, your I, I have on, you're good. Oh, look at that. That would look great. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Next time I'm in town then. You but, got it. Greg, thanks so much. I, I really appreciate that. And, and next time I'm on a surf trip down south, I think I'll just uh, swing Won't by. Yeah. Love to see you. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. Well, that's a wrap for this week's episode of the Zealous Podcast. I just want to give a quick thanks to Dr. Greg Rose, the Titleist Performance Institute. Now, last week, if you missed Tom House, legendary throwing coach for NFL quarterbacks like Tom Brady and Drew Brees, Make sure you click on that episode and follow through because we had a great time. And next week, I've got another legend in the field of functional training, sports performance, and one of the leaders behind the scenes, Dr. Gary Gray, founder of the Gray Institute. We'll see you then. Thanks for listening.